Hello. Today's topic is really, really important, and I'm so glad to have this opportunity to just have this discussion about how to measure our students' learning. And measuring the student achievement provides valuable information about the quality and the depth of their learning. So I have to tell you that today's topic is primarily focused on these two things, exams and rubrics, which is what we usually call as traditional ways of evaluating. So we all love cake. Well, I maybe you, many of you love cakes. So let's like look at a few of them. How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? I'm sure some of these, one of these will resonate with all of you. Maybe all of you have the same. But imagine that instead of saying you get to have one of these cakes, you actually add a bake-off. That means a contest, a competition. And I'm going to ask you to do this. Which of these cakes would you set, select as first, second, or third place? And you're going, oh no, wait, wait, excuse me. Um, I got to choose the one that I liked, and now you're saying that I'm in a formal competition and I have to choose? I mean, what am I going to select on? Well, let me see. I can say whether it's based on te the taste, or I can say, how does it look? Is it pretty? Um, how difficult? Does it look like it needs a lot of skills, or can I just kind of slap things together? How neat? Is there crumbs? Does the icing fall, fall off of it? or maybe how creative it is. And so really, I don't know what we're talking about, how to figure out which is first, second, or third place. So really, when we're saying things like that, we're talking about making a judgment, giving it a grade, determining its value, whether it's excellent, okay, or mm, throw this cake out. And so what we're doing is making a summative evaluation. And so we do this a lot, whether it's for cakes, or our primary responsibility as teachers, and we're teaching our students and hoping they learn. So that leads us to our learning objectives for this session. Again, I'll let you read them. Again, take note of these action verbs. You're going to define, you're going to describe, you're going to link, construct, and the final one, you're going to create. So. I'm going to have to um, talk about some important assertions here about making an exam or a quiz. First of all, tests are not just for assigning grades. They're supposed to provide learning for you and your students. Second of all, make sure that they are connected, the assessments with your goals. Third, don't rely on just one or two exams. I mean the worst pedagogy is to give uh, a course grade or for you a module grade just on a midterm and a final. Worst, bad, bad practice. Second one, and like I just said, uh, make sure this diverse, different kinds, not just exams, but using papers, using uh, uh, participation, uh, so all sorts of stuff, and making sure that it's frequent. And this session is just an introduction. I mean, we could do a whole modular course just on creating exams. So let's go a little bit further about what we're going to be talking today. We're going to talk about the course grade, and we're going to focus specifically on the red part, which is the exams. Like I said, we could uh, grade homework, projects, presentations, participation, things like that. And under exams, we're going to say, how do you develop a good one? What are some important grading principles that you must master, and how do you give feedback? Like I re mentioned before, is that the exams are a learning opportunity. So I have an important notice for you because this is what I hear from faculty back over here and on campus, and I'm sure many of you are also saying the same thing. Faculty report that grading student work is a very critical part of the responsibilities as a teacher, but you know what? It is also the most stressful part. And so that really means let, let's try to release the stress on you and also for your students so this is a um, less high risk uh, event for you and your students. Because these are the things that we really don't want to hear and it's very common. This is a trick question. We didn't learn this in class. Why are you testing this on this? 
you grade too hard. We did not learn this. And you know what? I was talking to a friend of mine, and that person got a higher grade, and we had the same answer. Now, why are they, why are they asking this? Well, we're going to spend um, this video and the next on answering those questions and eliminating or reducing those kind of comments on there. So, I can give you an exam right now. It's a test item exam. Of course, it's all anonymous, but I won't know what it is, but you will know. So, get out a piece of paper, number it one, two, three, four, five, read it, and write down either a T for true or F for a false, and I'll wait for you. Okay, now that you've done that, you may not be uh, sure about number five. When you see that X over here, that means time. One and a half times as long as it takes you. So for instance, if you said it, it takes you 20 minutes to do that, then maybe you should give the students 30 minutes. That's what one and a half times mean. Now you know how I work. I'm not gonna give you the answers because I want you to learn about this and I'm gonna test you at the end. So let's begin. Here's some example test items. Um, you may be familiar with this. Let's take a peek. Now let's look at another kind of items. Do you see the difference between those two? Look at the left, look at the right. When we look at the left, name, give, and these things, those are called objective items. That means you can answer it with one or two words as a response. In contracts, we have something called subjective items. And a constructive response means instead of me, the test maker, giving you the answer or you supply only one or two words, you have to give a more elaborate, ext extended um, explanation to these questions on here. So let's go and look what kinds of test items are objective or subjective. And here are some of these which you're probably very familiar with. Multiple choice, true, false, matching, and fill in the blank. And for subjective items, for constructive response where the students have to uh, write a more extended explanation, those are called short answer, essays, and problem solving, which are more extended projects that you have to do. Now, we always have to talk about advantages and disadvantages. Going back to the objective items, which are the ones about that takes only one or two answers for mobile choice, or true or false, fill in the blank. So here's the advantages. You can test a lot of content or objectives because you can write many, many items. It can also go up and down the continuum of Bloom's taxonomy, you know, from low all the way to high, and also can be scored more efficiently and accurately because all you're doing is looking for spe a specific word or number or on a multiple choice, A, B, C, D, true or false, a T or an F. So you can see how quickly you can do it. Matter of fact, you could probably bring anyone who is not in your uh, field and they could grade this if you give them the answer key. The limitation, it is difficult and consuming to construct, to write. Even professional test writers take a long time to write each item so that it is really good. And good means that it is a valid and reliable and appropriate. It relies heavily on the student's ability to read. That means especially for it's a long extended one, you are testing not only do they know the answer, but do they understand what um, the test item is. And because you want to go through it faster because you have to write so many items, it's much easier for you to write low level. What's the answer to this? Define that. What are the steps to? All right. So let's go to the next kind, which is the subjective or constructive response items. The advantage. It can also do a wide testing of the content, but not of the objectives. But a content, it can do that. Of course, there's no guessing because they have to write. And the students really can't uh, do cramming because cramming tends to lead to um, just the low level of thinking, of fill in the blank and identification. 
the limitations, we have to admit, it is, takes a really long time to grade. And in another opportunity, if I come back and talk to you, I'll talk to you about the most uh, effective way of grading and the most appropriate and fair way of doing it. It's difficult to standardize grading, to be consistent. We know that your standard goes up and down based on whose paper you read before and also whether, honestly, whether you're tired or not. Okay. If you get more tired, you tend to be more lenient on there. And again, when we talked about um, students' ability to read or write, this does punish them. Or it's a little bit punitive because you're testing two things at the same time. I've been talking for a while, so let's have an activity here. You're going to take an exam about exam items on there. Now, you know how I work. I work through an inductive method, which means you're going to discover these principles that I'm not going to lecture about it, even though I just did for the last few minutes. All right, you ready? Get out a piece of paper, and I want you to think about this. These are multiple choice items and also some um, true and false essay. This is about subjective and objective items. I'm going to give you a hint. These are all bad items. If you happen to be watching this video with a peer, grab that person next to you and look at this and analyze it among yourselves. Number one, it is multiple choice. Tell me what is wrong with it. It's not about whether you can answer it. It doesn't matter. All right. I don't know the answer, actually, but I can tell you why this is a badly constructed item. What you need to do is these are called, this is called the stem, and these are called, you could say the answers, but they're also called the distractors. When you have distractors like this that involve numbers, rank them from lowest to highest, meaning the smallest to the largest, so that it's easy for the, the student um, to find the answer. You don't want the, uh, the student to go up and down and s wasting time by searching for the answer. So order it. Let's go to the next one. You probably have done this a lot of times. I'm going to tell you um, in a minute. You tell me what is wrong with this one. All right, you are tired. You cannot think of any more distractors or possible answers. So you start doing things like that. No, no, don't do that. Make each one separately and relying on each other. And I know you're tired, and I know you can't think of any more. If you can't, then throw away this item. Let's go to the next one for you or you and your colleague to figure out. Do you know what's wrong with this one? In the stem, remember the stem is the top part, is that by the time the student gets to the end of the stem, they should be able to figure out the answer. When you give me just one word, there is a whole host of possible answers, and that is wasteful of time and effort. So write a complete stem, and then just choose the distractors on there. What is wrong with four and five? I'll let you talk again, or think, and think. Number four, philosophy and physiology are ancient fields of physiology. Sorry, let me read that again. Philosophy and physiology are ancient fields of study. Uh, Chilean, do you want me to answer about philosophy? or? physiology. Don't put two things in your stem because the students don't know which one you want them to answer. The second one is, I know you want to make it a little bit more difficult, but when you use the word not, that's a negative uh, stem, don't do that because it's uh, testing reading again and you just want to test the knowledge. So how did you do? I hope you, you did all right. If you did, then you, we can progress. Otherwise, that's okay because we didn't teach you any of this part. 
Oh, I have one more for you. Imagine that this is a subjective, open-ended one, and this is what you wrote. I won't wait for you to try to figure out because I'll just give you the answer. This is a much better way of writing it. First of all, what you did is use the word instead of describe, they wanted to explain. The reason is it's explained because there are three different sections that they need to do. One, a brief description, two, or B, supporters, and three, the research methods. So what you're doing is essentially um, structuring the response for their students, which is really good, and they know it's worth 10 points. All right, so I just gave you an exam about exam items. Let's go to the next part. My goodness, I'm gonna keep making you work. So here's an activity where you're gonna apply it right away. And what I want you to do is to think of a, cl of a class topic, and I want you to write it right there in that space or on the piece of paper. Think of a class topic. And I just want you to write two objective ones. You can write a multiple choice and a true false. And then after you do that, I want you to write one subjective test item, a short essay. And you just saw examples of that, and I'll let you work on it. I hope you had an opportunity to check with each other about the uh, writing two kinds of items. And that leads us to the end of today's video, which is you were able to define the difference between subjective and objective items, correct? And you also describe the advantages and limitations. And you also, as a bonus, got an opportunity to write both types of um, test items. And so that brings us to the conclusion of part A.